The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is the fifth anniversary of This Is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Five years ago, during the first broadcast of this program, it was our privilege to present two distinguished Americans, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and the Honorable J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Tonight, five years later, we are again privileged to bring you these same two gentlemen. Mr. Hoover will speak to you in person later in the program. Now, we are pleased to present Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson. Mr. Parkinson. Five years ago, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society undertook the sponsorship of This Is Your FBI. We did so because we saw in this program a unique opportunity to render a public service. An opportunity to bring to the American public a deeper understanding and a better appreciation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and its important role in safeguarding the lives and property of American citizens from crime, violence, and conspiracy. It is particularly fitting for the Equitable Society to sponsor such a program because the protection of American homes and American families is our business, too. For 91 years, we have been promoting security, preserving homes for widows and children, educating youth, providing comfort for elderly men and women, and peace of mind for the millions of people who have joined the Equitable Society. At the same time, life insurance dollars represent another force for good in the economic life of our country. Our investment funds, while earning interest for the members of the society, build railroads and factories, finance homes, participate in a score of industries, help maintain millions of people on payrolls, contributing materially to the highest living standards known to mankind. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Mercy Manhunt. This is Holy Week, and in many different parts of the world, pious people of all religions have one common dream, one common hope for the future. Their prayers go forth and ask that in some way, man may discover a piece of knowledge that has eluded him for all his thousands of years on earth. For knowledge which no civilization in all history has ever possessed. The wisdom to be able to preserve peace on earth. Goodwill toward man. The case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation chosen for dramatization tonight does not concern a kidnapping, a predatory scheme of extortion, or even the story of a whimsical swindle though each of those is available for the telling, since Holy Week to the criminals of the nation is merely another seven-day period in which to pillage and plunder. Instead, we have selected what in the parlance of the newspaper business is called a human interest story, a story involving, in the words of the title, a mercy manhunt. <laughs> Tonight's file opens at a railroad station in a small western town. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor stands talking to the station master as a freight train slowly approaches. This is your train, Taylor. You know where my car will be? Toward the back. Huh? Might as well walk down there, huh? Okay. What's this all about? Well, there's been a series of thefts in the last couple of weeks at the freight yard in the city. Two nights ago, the thieves broke open the seal on a car carrying an interstate shipment. That's what got us into the case. You got any idea who's been doing it? No. We raised a couple of single fingerprints in the last boxcar. They won't help us till we get us a suspect. Uh-huh. This car that I'm picking up here will be left on a spur at the open end of the freight yard. Some other agents are moving in, and they'll be in different parts of the yard. We'll keep in contact by our walkie-talkie. 
Well, this is your car, Taylor, and there's the engineer's lantern. You'd better hop aboard. Okay. Want a lift? No, no thanks. There we are. Ah, just in time. Goodbye, Fred. Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, Bill. Anything stirring at your end? No. Quiet over here, too. Bill. You see something? Yeah. What? Two men. Where? You you can't see them from where you are. They just climbed out from under the car next to me. What did they look like? I won't have time to describe them, Bill. They're coming toward this car. I'll call the others, Jim. We'll get there as soon as we can. Looks empty, Leo. Let's take a look. Give me a hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get the flashlight. You won't need one, huh? You're both under arrest. morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor knocks on the door of Agent in Charge Milburn's office. Oh, hello, Taylor. Mr. Milburn? I see that Trojan horse idea wound. Yes, sir. Have you interviewed the prisoners yet? Well, last night, sir, but I did all the talking. The only thing they'd admit was that their names are John Davenport and Leo Braddock. Are they the ones we've been looking for? Yes, sir. A well, single prince we got turned out to be the thumb and forefinger of Braddock. Hmm. Have you sent complete sets of prints of both men to Washington? As soon as we took them, sir. I've also got plenty of other evidence. Uh, what kind? Well, I found a key in Braddock's pocket that had a number stamped into it. I called the lock manufacturers and traced the thing to a garage on Madison Street. Uh -huh. The place contained five crates of cameras, three crates of portable typewriters, and other assorted loot. Mm -hmm. Taylor, it might be a good idea to check and see if either of those men has a local record. Uh, all right, sir. And we could clean up more than just the freight yard robberies with this. I'm Mrs. Davenport. John Davenport's mother. Davenport? Oh, one of the men we arrested last night. Yes. I went over to the jail. They showed me the prisoner who called himself John Davenport. But he's not my son. No. Well, possibly it's someone with the same name. But it said in this morning's paper that you arrested John L. Davenport, Jr. of 92 Ross Street... That's my address. What does your son look like? I have his picture in my purse just a minute. Here you are. Thank you. Yes, you're quite right. This isn't the man I arrested last night. Where did you get that address? From identification in his pocket. Why? Well, you see, I've been led to believe John was dead. Oh. Then I saw the story in this morning's paper. I knew it couldn't be him, but... Well, I had to make sure. What happened to your son? He was in a train wreck last month at Westfield. Oh. The car he was in turned over and burned. I was called to come and look at some bodies. I went out there. man showed me some they couldn't identify. He asked me if one of them was John. And I couldn't tell Mr. Taylor. Yes, of course. They did find his watch and a ring I gave him for his 23rd birthday. Oh, where were they? In the wreckage. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to go over to the jail in a few minutes. I'll tell you what, Mrs. Davenport. I'll try to find out how that prisoner got hold of your son's identification papers. to 
ask questions, Copper. You're wasting your time. No, we've got all the evidence we can use. We found that garage where you and Braddock stored your loot. So what'd you come down here for? Well, just before I left the office, I got a report back from Washington on your fingerprints. What about it? Your name isn't John L. Davenport, Jr. It's George Ludlow. So? So where did you get those identification papers that you showed us last night? I want them in a crap game. Look, those papers belong to the son of a woman who came to my office today. He was in a train wreck. She doesn't know whether he's dead or alive, and I'd like to help her find out. You want to tell me where you got them or not? What's in it for me? Nothing, nothing at all. I'm just giving you a chance to do something decent. Now, come on, what can you tell me? Well, I was riding the rods last month. We got close to a town named Westfield, and the train I'm on hits another one coming the other way. Yeah, go on. I'm lucky I get thrown clear without a scratch. And I see a guy's laying next to me. He was a regular passenger. Mm -hmm. I reach into his kick, take out his wallet, and put mine in his pocket. Was he alive? I ain't no doctor. All I know is he was laying there. Was he burned? No. Cut up? No. And all you took was his wallet? That's all I wound up with. What? I took his watch off him and the ring he was wearing, but I dropped him in blue. Oh, why? I heard somebody coming. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, nothing right now. If I need anything, I'll know where to find it. Just a minute. Yes? Good morning, Mrs. Davenport. Oh, good morning, Mr. Stanley. Please come in. Thank you. I've got some information about your son. Yes, what is it? Well, I took a trip to Westfield yesterday. I went to the hospital where the injured passengers were treated. Oh, I saw the list of people they took to the hospital that didn't have his name on it. Oh, yes, I know. But I found a card of admittance in their records under the name of George Ludlow. Who? George Ludlow. That's the correct name of that prisoner that you saw. Oh? You see, this Ludlow was on the same train with John, and after the accident, he changed wallets with him. He changed wallets? Yes. Now, here's my theory. If a survivor identified as George Ludlow is brought into the hospital, then I believe there's a very good chance that your son is still alive. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now I'd like to introduce one of the youngest-looking men of 60 I've ever seen. Well, that's a mighty nice compliment, Mr. Keating. Mr. Thomas, I understand that about 20 years ago, you started an equitable, independent 60s plan. Today, that plan is paid up, and you've quit work to enjoy the three freedoms that go with such a plan. That's correct. First, freedom from money worries and job worries. Financial independence. Every month, Sure as shooting, there's a check from the Equitable Society in my mailbox. You can bet your boots I'll never have to ask anybody to help support me. Second, with the Equitable Independent 60s plan, you're free to live anywhere you choose. Well, my wife inherited a little place in the grand old state of Missouri. That's where we're settled down. Third, you have freedom to do all the things you've always wanted to do. I'm one of those golf maniacs, Mr. Keating. Right now, I'm making up for all the golf I missed when I was chained to my disc. So, all in all, I counted a lucky day when I discovered that I could afford an equitable, independent 60s plan. It's a fact. You don't have to earn big money to begin an equitable, independent 60s plan. Ask your equitable representative to explain why you probably have a big head start towards independent 60s because of Social Security and life insurance already owned. Often only a small amount of additional insurance is all that's required. A few dollars a week did it for me. Friends, why not take a leaf from Bill Thomas's book? Why not phone your Equitable Society representative without delay? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> And now back to the FBI file, The Mercy Manhunt. (laughs) 
Tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation makes an obvious point, but one which is often either forgotten or overlooked. The profession of law enforcement has many facets. It entails more than tracking down a wanted criminal or laying traps such as the one you witnessed earlier this evening. They are all part and parcel of the job of being a law enforcement officer. But the other side of the profession, the side the general public rarely sees or hears about, is what keeps so many men at their jobs, while by and large they are being underpaid and overworked. What keeps those men on their jobs, despite outside offers of greater salary, is perhaps best exemplified by the assignment Special Agent Taylor has taken upon himself. An assignment to find a woman's missing son on his own time and at his own expense. If this were the only such case in the Bureau's files, it would not have been chosen for dramatization tonight. The fact is that the files not only of your FBI, but of local police in almost every city are replete with similar instances. Instances where these men have proven they are not only conscientious defenders of the public welfare, but instinctively and basically they are something it is even more important to be. They are decent human beings who know that each man on earth is irrevocably his brother's keeper. Tonight's file continues later that day at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Agent in Charge Milburn. Can you spare a few minutes, Mr. Milburn? Certainly. It's on your mind, Taylor. Do you remember my telling you about a Mrs. Davenport? The woman whose son was in the train wreck? That's right, sir. I did some work yesterday trying to locate him. Yes, I just read the report of your interview with Ludlow. Oh, then you know about the wallets being switched. Yes. Well, I found a record of a George Ludlow having been admitted to the Westfield Hospital on the day of the train wreck. But nothing on him leaving the place. Uh, well, you know, of course, that we have no jurisdiction in the case. Oh, I realize that, sir. But I'd, I'd like to see if I can make some more progress. Well, that'll take time. Well, I have three days' leave coming, sir, and I thought, well, if you could spare me. You want to go back to Westfield? Yes, sir. I'm sure the patient who was entered under the name of George Ludlow was really John Davenport. I see. I tried to locate the nurse who took care of him, but no duty records were kept on the night of the accident. Well, how many nurses were there? Oh, quite a few of them, sir, and mostly volunteer help. It would mean interviewing all of them, but, well, I'd like to try. All right. Tell Henderson you're taking three days' leave with my permission. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, young man. Are you Mrs. Cortland? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Well. Mrs. Cortland, I'm looking for a man who was in the train wreck last month. Oh. I understand that you helped out at the hospital that week? Yes, everybody did. Yes, I'm finding that out. Tell me, Mrs. Cortland, do you remember any of the patients? Not very well. There were so many. Well, I have a picture here. Maybe this will help. Yes. Yes, I do remember this man. Are you sure? Oh, positive. You see, a few hours after the accident, he got out of bed and asked for permission to leave. Oh? Well, he had no visible wounds, and we needed his bed so badly, so I said it was all right. Well, then he had recovered. Oh, well, now I don't know. Well, Mrs. Cortland, can you give me any idea at all where he went after leaving the hospital? Oh, no, I haven't the faintest notion. Oh, I see. Oh, I do wish I could be of more help. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Cortland. I, I gave myself three days to find this man, and I've still got two of them left. Jim Taylor, Mr. Milburn. I thought you might be interested in a progress report. Have you located Davenport? No, not yet, sir, but I am making some headway. I found the nurse who helped take care of him after the accident. Good. She said Davenport left the hospital under his own power. Well, where'd he go from there? Well, the nurse didn't know, so I asked the Westfield newspaper to run his picture on the front page this morning. Well, did you get any results? Yeah, a bus driver called in. Said he picked up Davenport in front of the hospital. He remembered him because his clothes were all torn. He looked like a survivor of the wreck. Oh, I see. Well, where'd he ride to? End of the line. The driver said Davenport wouldn't have gotten off there if he hadn't gone through and cleared out the bus. Uh, did he mention where he was headed? No, sir, he didn't. Mr. Milburn, from the little I know about it, my guess is Davenport has got amnesia. Mm, it sure sounds like him. Well, there's nothing at the end of the bus line but farmhouses, but I'm going to go down there and see if I can pick up his trail. 
Mrs. Pittman? That's right. Do you ever remember seeing this man? Well, yes, that's a good picture of him. Could you tell me where he is now? Is he in trouble? No, ma'am, he's missing and we'd like to find him. Well, he stopped at the farm about a month ago and we gave him a meal. Do you know where he went from here? My husband sent him someplace to get work. Oh, where's that? Over to Colfax to join the berry pickers. Yes, sir, I'm foreman of this gang. I'd like to find out if you've got this man working for you. You recognize him? Mm Mm-hmm. Is he here? Nope, he left off picking two weeks ago. Oh, do you know where he went? Mm Mm-hmm, to Centerville to pick apples. Oh, thanks very much. Yes, he was here. Calls himself Jones. You know where he is now, Mr. Green? No, he quit here because of bad headaches. Oh? There was a man in town recruiting labor to help build the new highway up the ridge. But Jones didn't go with him. Are you sure? Stands to reason. If he was too sick to pick apples... Oh, thanks, Mr. Green. I'll go up there and take a look anyway. I can find the foreman up here. You're talking to him. Oh, can you spare me a minute? Not much more. Well, I'm from the FBI. Here are my credentials. What can I do for you? Will you take a look at this picture, please? Well, I suppose I know him. Don't you? No. Have you hired anybody in the last couple of days? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, one yesterday and two the day before. Uh-huh. And none of them look like the picture. Well, two of them don't. One wears a beard. I don't know what he looked like without it. Oh? Where is he? You see the guy cutting open the bag of cement? You near the mixer? Yep. Thanks. I think I'll go over and talk to him. All right. Go ahead. Hello. Hello? You're John Davenport, aren't you? No. I'm Charlie Jones. Oh, I think you're mistaken. What? Come on, John. We can talk about it on the way home. I got here as soon as I could, Mr. Midland. You're in time, Miss Damport. When do you expect me? Very soon. Did Mr. Taylor say how John is? Well, I, um... I didn't want to tell you on the phone. Seems he's suffering from amnesia. Oh? I don't know whether you're familiar with amnesia or not, but... uh, I know a little about it. Well, then you're aware that he'll undoubtedly require medical attention. Oh, yes. Oh, hello, Mr. Davenport. Hello, sir. Taylor? John's here? Yes, ma'am. But before you see him, there's something you should know. What? All the way down here on the train, I I tried to get through to him. Nothing helped, ma'am. He doesn't remember anything or anybody. I'm just grateful that you brought him here. Where is he, Mr. Taylor? He's in that room. Good luck, Mr. Tamboy. Thank you. John... Do you know me? Know you? It's mother. Mother? Mother? Oh, mother. <laughs> Leo Braddock and George Ludlow were tried and convicted in federal court on a charge of violating the theft from interstate shipment statute and each sentenced to a five-year term. And now, speaking to you from FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., we bring you the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. Mr. Hoover. Tonight's program on This Is Your FBI marks the beginning of its sixth year on the air. We were a nation at war when this program was born. The stress and strain of combat caused gigantic dislocations in our society. It was disheartening to note the steady rise in crime 
and to see thousands of our boys and girls engulfed in a criminal horde. We were a busy nation at that time, and adult America showed little or no concern about crime. We in law enforcement, however, recognized the gravity of the situation. We hoped that the crime condition would be temporary, but we were eager to take positive action to attempt to awaken Americans to this situation, to crush indifference in the adult mind, and to sound the call to action. That is why the FBI has been proud to cooperate with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States under the able leadership of Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, which undertook the sponsorship of this program as a real public service and with Jerry Devine, its producer. The presentation, This Is Your FBI, has played a tremendous role in this vital educational effort. It has, from week to week, illustrated the responsibility and duty of law enforcement in protecting society. It has pointed out how citizens can best cooperate with law enforcement. It has shown the need for crime prevention methods, and it has highlighted the problem of juvenile delinquency. This program has done much to portray lawlessness in its proper light. It has effectively taught our how citizens can protect themselves from criminal elements. The job, however, is by no means finished. During the year 1949, a major crime was committed every 18 seconds. More persons aged 21 years were arrested last year than in any other age group. This is not a time for wishful thinking. It is a time for vigilance, for action. The battle against crime will be won or lost through the interests and actions of the mothers, fathers, and the adults of the nation. Crime challenges the parents to prepare their children to be the heirs apparent of the future. It calls upon education to instill a deep respect for American institutions. It cries out to our churches to prevent corruption and decay by emphasizing fundamental principles of morality and decency. It challenges every community in the nation to take positive action to eradicate focal points of lawlessness. The ability of the community in which you live to meet the problems of crime depends upon you. Your homes, your churches, your schools, your civic organizations, and your law enforcement agencies can only be as good as you make them. You alone can help win or lose the battle against crime. Take inventory now and make the crime problem your fight. Next week, we will bring you another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a factual recount of the workings of an elusive criminal. Its subject... Jewel Theft. Its title, The Perilous Secret. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Eleanor Audley, Ed East, Herb Ellis, Tony Hughes, Bill Johnstone, Ted Reed, and Peggy Weber. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The perilous secret on This Is Your FBI. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, fun for the whole family, follows immediately over most of these ABC stations. Stay tuned. Whenever there's a question of safety, remember, always play it safe. Don't take chances with America's number one accident killer, home accidents. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.